Sleep is a complex and dynamic process that affects how you function in ways scientists are still trying to understand. It affects almost every type of tissue and system in the body, from the brain, heart and lungs, to metabolism, immune function, mood and disease resistance. The advent of artificial light has substantially altered sleep timing in industrialised countries, and whilst everyone needs sleep, its biological purpose remains a mystery. During sleep, our sensory threshold increases. In other words, sleeping people perceive fewer stimuli, but can generally still respond to loud noises and other salient sensory events. This occurs despite us being placed in a vulnerable state, such as predation or danger. In all cases, however, some processing of the external world remains intact, given that sleeping animals can be awoken by some intense stimuli, for example a loud noise or a bright light, or even by the sound of a baby cooing or hearing one's own name. How does a sleeping, unconscious brain retain the ability to process sensory information? Flies, like humans, discern the quality of different sensory stimuli during sleep and respond accordingly, waking when challenged with salient stimuli only. These stimuli can be qualitative or quantitative. We know the basics of how a sleeping brain modulates its arousal threshold to filter the quantitative nature of a stimulus, such as gently touching someone versus violently slapping them. However, it is more difficult to ascertain the neurobiological underpinnings of modulating qualitative arousal threshold, for example, responding to one's own name versus someone else's name. The rationale for this study was to see how a sleeping, unconscious brain retains the ability to process qualitative sensory information. Once established that this aspect of sleep in flies recapitulates that which is observed in humans, we can go the extra mile to figure out what specific neurons are involved. Now we are in a phase where um, flies are in a perfect spot to study complex uh, problems of neuroscience. The reason is that their behavior is complicated enough to be interesting, but at the same time their brain is simple enough to be understood. So they are at this uh, sweet spot. Uh, recently we also have a complete connectome, so a complete map of each connection between all, every single neuron in the drosophila brain. This study showed that Drosophila, like humans, are able to discern the quality of different sensory stimuli during sleep. To modulate odor saliency, acetic acid was used, the main component of vinegar, because it is an ecologically relevant odorant for the vinegar fly, Drosophila melanogaster, already shown to carry different valence depending on the perceived concentration. And, and we used um, acetic acid to start with um, as a stimulus, giving flies um, two different concentrations of acetic acid, either 5% or 10%. And the reason why we chose those two specific concentrations is because it's known from the literature that flies respond during wakefulness, respond differently to those concentrations. 5% is a, um, a good stimulus, it smells like good food. 10% smells like um, not so good food, so they are uninterested to it. So what, I, what it means is that they respond to 5%, which is the salient stimulus, is calling their name, but they don't respond to 10%, even though it's quantitatively stronger, because it doesn't have salience. So what we found with acetic acid was really interesting, but we needed to test our hypothesis in a much more robust way. So what we did was we stimulated sleeping flies with a variety of different odours. Uh, some odorants uh, flies find attractive when awake, uh, so these would be like fruit pulps and vinegar. Um, some odours that they are indifferent to and other odours that they find aversive like geosmin which is produced by kind of toxic bacteria and uh, CO2 for example. And what we found was that flies are actually more likely to wake up to odorants that they didn't like compared to the ones that they did like. To carry out this experiment an ethoscope based robotic machine was developed in order to selectively probe flies with air puffs containing the acetic acid. Methods are important for this paper because uh, they rely on uh, equipment that we develop uh, purposely for this uh, research. The way it works is that we are able to monitor flies at the single animal level, so we know what a single fly is doing at any given time. This is done through a computer um, that can monitor um, up to 2,000 flies a day. And uh, what these computers do is they, uh, they know that uh, when a fly is awake, uh, when it's feeding, or when they are asleep. And we program the system to in interfere with the flies whenever they fall asleep. And the way, we, the way we do it is we send a puff of odor when we think the flies are asleep. And then we, we see how they react to this odor. 
Now, do they respond to this uh, at the same time during all phases of sleep? One would assume, well, why not? But in fact, what we found is that that's not the case. Uh, they respond mostly um, during the late phase of the night. Now, this could be <clears throat> because their sleep is different. It could be because this is a food odor, and so maybe they are less hungry at the time of the day. So there are different reasons. We don't know yet. Um, but it's interesting to uh, propose that uh, perhaps uh, there are different sleep stages, like in humans, uh, deep sleep, light sleep, and they respond differently because of that. Another quality of human sleep appears to be the ability to regulate the arousal threshold based on their needs. Sleeping somewhere new for the first time, such as in a friend's house or camping, causes the brain to subconsciously become more alert and sensitive to external stimuli. So we wanted to see whether this is the same, this is true is the same for, for flies, so we, we tried different conditions in which we, um, for instance, sleep deprived flies to make them more tired, or we gave them, um, uh, we put them on a diet, so to starve them for a few hours. Um, we also got them drunk, we gave them ethanol so that they will just sleep uh, um, passing out. And, uh, and we saw that all those conditions did indeed change their ability to respond. So the finding that starvation appears to reduce arousal thresholds was an interesting one. But again, we wanted to test this more robustly. And so again, we turned to our panel of odorants ranging from aversive to neutral to attractive. And we probed sleeping flies that had either been fed or starved uh, with this panel of odorants. Um, before, we'd found that under fed conditions, flies were more likely to wake up to odorants that they didn't like, um, whereas under starved conditions, they were more likely to wake up to those that were related to food. So this is really showing that animals are able to adjust their arousal thresholds based on their internal state and, and their own needs. The final part of the study offers a blueprint of some of the neurons involved in subconscious processing and its modulation. We uh, show that this odor is obviously perceived by the fly nose. Uh, it goes to the first layer in the brain, then to the second layer in the brain. And then from there, we found that these neurons uh, connect to uh, the only known sleep center in the fly. And so we were able to find that there is a connection between sensor information and the sleep center, which is, is very interesting. Uh, and then we ask ourselves, so at what point, uh, what stage during this uh, circuit uh, the modulation happen, right? The getting drunk or getting tired or getting hungry. At what point does this get modulated? And we found that there are at least uh, two gate points which can open or close this ability to wake up to these uh, compounds. One interesting thing we found using this essay is that we might ask ourselves uh, whether flies have different phases of sleep, for instance. It's something that's similar to what happens to humans. Um, we can also uh, explore a bit better um, how does a sleeping brain keep some of this circuit awake, right? Because if, if sleep requires you to shut down your brain to a certain extent, it's not a complete shutdown, but if sleep requires you to you know, silence your brain activity, how can you keep at the same time brain activity high in only those neurons? And, and do you pay a price for it or not?